Coming up on Tempo in Depth, we travel the globe with our neighbors involved in international outreach. First, meet a team of Lafayette students helping high schoolers from Madagascar get into American universities. Then, see some of the photographer Frank Smith's amazing images from India, South Sudan, and Haiti. Plus, we'll learn about a local nonprofit that spreads literacy to countries all over the world. A look at how our community reaches out to nations near and far. Don't go anywhere. Tempo in Depth starts right now. The people of Air Products feel privileged to bring this programming to you. By supporting education and the arts, Air Products strives to improve the quality of life here in the Lehigh Valley, where we call home. You're safe at home at Luther Crest, a Diacon senior living community in Allentown. Our mission is to offer premier accommodations and services so residents can cultivate a healthy and fulfilling retirement. At Luther Crest, we offer independent living apartments and cottages, personal care, skilled nursing, rehabilitative services, and more. Plus, the Luther Crest team strives to provide each person family-like support. You might say it's like a home run. Luther Crest. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. Tonight, we hope to inspire you to make the world a better place. That's what many businesses, schools, and organizations in our region hope to accomplish through international outreach. On the campus of Lafayette College in Easton, a group of students use Facebook and email to keep in touch with their new friends in Madagascar, a large island nation off the southeastern coast of Africa. I recently had the chance to learn more about this special program aimed at bringing more Malagasy students to America. Adjusting to the rigors of college life often proves difficult enough. So these are the Lime 2 team, right? Now imagine starting at age 16 in a foreign country more than 8,000 miles from the only home you've ever known. Now you have some idea what Rebecca Ramingami Hanta faced when she first stepped onto the campus of Lafayette College in August 2012. I'm learning every day from every area and I really like it very much. The always smiling Rebecca, now 17, rose to the challenge of double majoring in international affairs and economics with passion and determination. Her goal? To one day return to her home country of Madagascar. I want to create an educational center back home and uh, uh, I want to help uh, women in difficulties like single mother have a center for them and that's my dream. She's done really well here, and she's, to me, she sort of shows how successful the Malagasy students can be here. Um, very determined, very eager to learn everything she can and go back and make Madagascar a better place. As she sips a cup of hot cocoa with her good friend Emily Noel. Rebecca's like my little sister. <laughs> I literally, we get lunch together and dinner together all the time. Rebecca says she wouldn't be here in America pursuing her dream without Emily and her peers from the Lafayette Initiative for Malagasy Education, called LIME for short. We're trying to help students come to America to study so they can go back to Madagascar and make the country better than it already is. Founded in 2010 by Professor David Stifel, the LIME program sends 10 Lafayette College students to Madagascar each year. During a two- to three-week winter term, the Lafayette students teach high schoolers from Madagascar, called Malagasy's, how to apply to American colleges. Uh, this was an opportunity for our students to work with Malagasy students to uh, get a different type of education that they would get in the French system um, and uh, one that will broaden their horizons and uh, create more opportunities for them. But why Madagascar? a large, French-colonized island nation off the southern coast of Africa. The real Madagascar is full of people, uh, full of people who are uh, lovely people. Um, and uh, the countryside is beautiful as well, but it's also one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, and so life is, is difficult, um, and um, people are looking for opportunities to better their lives. Less than 100 Malagasy students study in American colleges. 
To increase that number, Lafayette students work with students from a public high school in Madagascar's capital city. They prepare them for the SATs and the test of English as a foreign language, help them complete admission forms, and practice English, a third language for most behind Malagasy and French. And they always say, I want to achieve my dream, I want to achieve my dream, and their dream is to make Madagascar a wonderful place, and it is, but they all, the students realize how poor it is. They know that, and they just want to make it better because they love it. They build relationships that last long after the college students return to campus. A lot of them on Facebook. They're, they're all over Facebook, and uh, I get a message from them like pretty much every week. That's how Rebecca stayed in touch with Emily since they first met in 2011. In 2012, she became the first Lyme student to attend college in America. She just wants to learn so much and will do anything. She went through feats to get here and feats to get to the high school um, that we were teaching at, and she just has done astounding things. In August, Lafayette will welcome its second Malagasy student, a young woman named Prisca, who happens to be Rebecca's best friend. Actually really exciting. I worked with um, Prisca uh, the hours before she sent off her application, so the finishing touches on her personal statement and application, I got to spend those last moments with her before we sent it off. Next year, Rebecca will return to Madagascar as part of the Lyme team to show other students what's possible. Because without the Lyme program, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't realize my biggest dream, and I wouldn't be able to go back, because I hope to go back and change something in my country. She hopes to inspire other students to follow in her footsteps. Photographer Frank Smith joins me now. Frank has worked with a number of organizations, nonprofits, to capture images from all around the world in an effort to raise awareness for specific causes. Frank, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure, thank you. What's your purpose when you go out and shoot? Well, my uh, passion is photography, and I have a full time job, but uh, my avocation is photography, and of late, I've uh, focused a fair amount of my t attention on what I call philanthropic photography. And uh, this allows me the opportunity to travel to many parts of the world for many different causes. Where are some of the places that you visited and photographed? Well, in uh, July of 2011, I was fortunate to travel to um, Africa and actually in several countries, Uganda and Sudan. And I traveled there with the intent of trying to help an organization called Alarm has to do with the reconciliation efforts that are taking part in that, uh, in that part of the world. And I was fortunate that I was able to time that trip uh, right around the same time that uh, the South was going to secede from the North. So I was actually able to witness the birth of a nation at the same time. I'm always amazed when I look at your photographs that we're not looking at landscapes, we're not looking at buildings, we're looking at people. Mm, that's correct. And uh, that's a big part of it. And part of my task was for this organization was to bring back a story to tell a little bit about the efforts that are taking place in that part of the world. And their intent was to use the images that I bring back to help with that story and use that for their marketing campaigns and some of the other efforts in trying to bring awareness to the United States. You've also traveled to India. What did you do there? Well, India, that was one of the more challenging uh, projects that I was asked to do. I went there with an organization called Worthwhile Wear. It has to do with the uh, child sex trade. And uh, we traveled to Mumbai and Pune. And uh, as part of that assignment, I actually was asked to go into some of the brothels that were there. And this is something that was totally out of my comfort zone. And uh, see if we could uh, photograph some of the wi uh, women and uh, uh, people involved there to tell their story and how they got trapped into these situations, again with the hope and intent of bringing this awareness back uh, so that uh, the whole effort is about uh, trying to avoid these situations. In one of those photographs uh, from Mumbai, there's a beautiful woman and she's standing uh, sort of in the foreground and there's a huge, uh, just what looks like a mound of rubble in the background. What are we actually seeing in that photograph? Well, this, uh, this woman, that's where she lives and immediately at her door is one of the largest uh, slums and the largest dumps in the world. And uh, it's all kinds of refuge that is dumped behind her uh, living quarters, if you will. And uh, again, the intent of that photograph was to show the contrast of this uh, uh, smiling young lady with uh, uh, this amazing amount of debris behind her. Some of your most um, amazing images, in my opinion, uh, came from a trip to Haiti. Yes, uh, that was a, um, 
uh, an assignment that I worked with an organization called ITOT, and uh, this is an organization that deals with uh, handicapped children around the world, and their purpose and intent is to be able to provide therapy and care to people that don't have resources or access to these resources, if you will. And again, that trip uh, involved, uh, again, trying to create awareness to the problem and the lack of resources that are there. And uh, what they do is they try to bring training to both the uh, person involved and the family members so that they have an opportunity to uh, administer care after uh, the training takes place. It looked like a lot of those photographs were taken either in a medical facility or some kind of orphanage. Well, what, uh, where we traveled were primarily orf- orphanages, and uh, in Haiti, uh, in particular, if you have a disability, you're looked at uh, as uh, somewhat of a, an outcast, and in many cases, they, uh, the children there are, are left and end up in orphanages, and that's where a lot of the focus was, was again to bring awareness to those situations. I wanted to ask you specifically about uh, the photograph of the girl in the pink shirt. Well, I took that picture, and her face is not shown, and I did that on purpose. But if you look closely at the photograph, it says, if you think I'm cute, you should see my mom. And the reason that was significant to me in any event was the fact that this poor little girl probably has no idea who her mom was. It was obviously a shirt that was donated, so that really resonated with me. And uh, just she turned out to be a real sweet young lady, allowed me to spend a fair amount of time with her. I photographed her for actually probably in excess of an hour and uh, just a pleasant young lady, but the impact of that shirt is what uh, prompted me to take that image. What do you hope that people will take away from your photographs, the ones they're seeing today and maybe others that they find on their own? Well, uh, many years ago when I started in my photography uh, path is I took pictures with the intent of creating memories. Now my photography is about telling stories, and my hope is that these stories will resonate uh, with uh, people around the world that may not be aware of the problems uh, that we have in other parts of the world. And the hope is for uh, this ultimately to bring uh, alleviation to some of these issues and uh, awareness and that we as a world can uh, work to maybe minimize that going forward. Frank, thank you so much for making it a part of your day to be here with us tonight. I'm really grateful. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Well, for many of us, there's nothing quite like a good book. Almost 3 billion books are sold each year in the United States, and that doesn't even include e-books. Yet there are people who don't have access to books. Lehigh Valley residents Scott and Kathy Lieber decided to do something about that. They created Judith's Reading Room, a nonprofit which supplies books to active duty members of the U.S. military. They supply children here and in developing countries with books. Since 2010, they've distributed more than 50,000 books to those who need them. Here's Tempo in Depth's Grover Silcox with more. What does a good book mean to you? It transports you into out of your ordinary life and into something extraordinary. And there is still something to be said for just having a good old-fashioned book. I love to read all kinds of mysteries and novels and biographies and autobiographies and everything there is. It's everything to me to hold a book, to feel a book. King Max, Who Stole the Wizard of Oz. Like a lot of people, Kathy and Scott Lieber love to get their hands on a good book. They've shared that passion throughout their 40-year marriage. But they know that millions of people have limited or no access to books. That's why they founded Judith's Reading Room, a Bethlehem-based nonprofit which collects donated gently used or new books and distributes them to those who need them. We founded Judith's Reading Room as a legacy in remembrance of my oldest first cousin, Judith F. Krug who was with the American Library Association for 40 years. And her main mandate was to support the First Amendment, the freedom to read. The U.S. military knocked on their door first. Active duty soldiers at Camp Phoenix in Afghanistan wanted a base library. No problem. The Liebers and their hundreds of volunteers sent the books. The soldiers were so grateful, they dedicated the base library to Judith Krug. The volunteers at Judith's Reading Room continue to inspect, pack, and ship to the base. They even include handwritten letters. Every box we've ever shipped contains a handwritten letter. We understand the loneliness. We understand that books can take you to a place that is very different from the trenches in Afghanistan. The Liebers and their volunteers get lots of thank you letters in return from the troops. Reading helps pass the time between missions and is very relaxing. 
major U.S. Army. Kathy and Scott also learned about the military's efforts to educate Afghan children. So they started sending children's books for the soldiers to give out. One of their major mandates at uh, Camp Phoenix is called Operation Outreach, which is to um, teach children English and build schools uh, for children in Afghanistan. Thank you for your donation of books to Operation Outreach. This will only continue in spreading goodwill from the American people to the Afghans. In many cases, these are children who've never had a book. Judith's Reading Room now sends books and libraries to kids and adults in Cambodia, Nigeria, Albania, and Indonesia, and even in the Lehigh Valley, wherever people need books. I don't care if he's in Bethlehem or if he's in New Delhi, India. It is a child's right to have a book to learn to read. Literacy itself, regardless of the language, uh, provides empowerment. Underpinning their passion is a passion for detail, for inspecting every book to make sure it's in good condition and noting each book's value. We know that as of last month, we had packed almost 52,000 books with a cover price of $550,000 worth of books. They sort and match books to recipients whether they're intended for Old Orchard Nursing Home in the Lehigh Valley or the USS George Herbert Walker Bush aircraft carrier in Norfolk, Virginia. As far as to the troops, uh, we'll ship out anywhere from 15 to 20 boxes. Now, with a flat rate box, as, as many books as you can fit in a box will go. It doesn't, it's not based on weight. So it's, um, it's a flat rate. It's like $14.85 now. They ship to APO and FPO military addresses for much less than regular postal rates. They make every cent count to get the books to the troops and especially the kids. We're so interconnected anymore and by empowering children with a book, we are empowering ourselves. And so from a tiny office in South Bethlehem, the mission continues to help people beat swords into plowshares through the power of a book. For Tempo and Depth, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you so much, Grover. To learn more about international outreach, Brian McDonald joins me now. Brian is the Director of International Learning at DeSales University. Thanks for being with us today, Brian. Sure, I'm happy to be here. Now, you manage service learning trips, which are different from study abroad trips. What's the difference between the two? Well, uh, study abroad typically is for academic credit, um, for tourism, for, for all kinds of reasons. We all, But the service trips are really to reach out to some vulnerable populations in poor countries around the world. They and tend to be shorter term as well, I'm sorry. How long does a typical service trip last versus a study abroad trip? Well, a typical study abroad trip can be anywhere from eight weeks to an entire semester to an entire year for some students. Uh, the service trips are, are very condensed. They tend to be 10 days to two weeks in, in duration. So where do you currently have students out on service trip? Well, right now we have a group of about 30 students who are in South Africa working with the Oblate min uh, missions in South Africa. So they're working in schools, uh, in orphanages. Um, they're working with the poor and the hungry in those areas. So they do all kinds of activities with them. Are you in contact with them while they're there? And if so, what are you hearing? Um, well, uh, the only contact, they just arrived, so the only contact I've had so far is that they're there and they're safely there. Uh, but they do have uh, a blog going for this trip, so anyone can read up on what's going on with them and the activities that they're doing each day. And share with us what some of the past trips, the most successful past trips that you've done are well. As well. Um, a few years ago, we had a group of about the same amount of students who were in Bangalore, India, um, working with a school there. Um, so working with English, um, helping students to develop their English skills, um, helping to rebuild some of the facilities that, that weren't doing so well. So they were painting buildings and rebuilding things. And even things as simple as helping the students get to school. The bus would drop them off across a four or five lane highway and then the students had to walk across it. So if you can imagine our students, uh, children, walking across 78 to get to school each day, that's what they're facing. So just helping them to get across the street so that they can get to school each day was one of the activities that they did. You know, we take for granted in this country that we can get to school, that that's something that, you know, in many cases we have buses and cars that we can get ourselves to and from school. Absolutely. Something that that really makes yeah. you take for granted. Yeah. 
We've also sent students to Calcutta, India, um, working with the, the missionaries of charity or the, the sisters of Mother Teresa and continuing the work that, that she started and helping the, the women there who are, who are doing so much for the poor and the hungry there. So they're going out into the slums and into the community, handing out food, handing out safe drinking water, um, trying to do some education about, you know, food cleanliness and things like that. So uh, really eye-opening experiences for students because in Calcutta uh, is part of India where people still suffer from polio. Um, we take it for granted because of all our vaccinations. But um, for them to see you know, people in these kinds of, of, of states is really eye-opening for our students. Now, where do you want to go in the future? Um, we have thought about going to a refugee camp outside of Lima, Peru. Um, sometime in the 80s and 90s there was a, you know, a civil war within Peru um, so a lot of the people from the mountains came down to the cities for safety um, so there is actually an abandoned quarry uh, where there, I, th I believe there's about 100,000 people who live there. They have their water trucked in every day. They have a lot of their services and food services trucked in but there's a small medical clinic. There's a school that's doing education. There is um, a church there as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for our students to go there and, and help the people there in any way that they can. Why does the sales make this commitment to service learning trips? Well, it, it really keeps in line with our mission as a Catholic university. You know, we want to help people um, no matter what the situation is, but more importantly, it, it's really what our students want to do. Uh, our students are overwhelmingly caring and kind people who, who just want to reach out to, to anyone they can. You know, the Center for Service and Social Justice, which, which runs these trips, not only does these international trips, they do domestic prog local programs, domestic programs. Um, but even more than that, some of our students w will just, you know, when Sandy hit, um, they just got in their cars and went up to see if they could help. They didn't bother to try to get into an organization. They just went up and said, well, we'll help however we can. Um, same thing with Katrina. So uh, wherever they can help, our students really want to help people. I, you also mentioned that in addition to these service trips where students actually go and help, that you also do different kinds of fundraising efforts as well, uh, where they're sending funds or goods to, to places around true, the world. True, that's true. Um, our physician assistant program each year does a car wash on campus that raises money for Haiti. Um, the students who are in South Africa right now also did some fundraising and received some grant money, I believe, um, to buy some iPads to give to the students in the schools that they're working with. And the students who went this year, in addition to all their luggage, packed 12 suitcases with um, sporting equipment and clothing, school supplies, uh, foodstuffs, anything that they could to, to bring to the students to help them out. So they, they are very generous as well. So even if you can't actually attend one of the trips, there's still a lot you can do? Absolutely, absolutely. What do you expect from the students when they go on these trips, and how, are, how do the students fund them? Well, the, the, the university partially subsidizes the trip, so it usually works out that the students pay, you know, right around what their airfare would cost them. So it, it makes it much more affordable for students who otherwise may not have been able to do this. But in terms of, you know, what we expect is just that they're going to go there with an open mind and an open heart and, and do the best that they can for, for whomever they can. And how many students are on a typical trip? Anywhere from 15 to 30 students for, for a short-term trip. Great. Thank you so much for this wonderful information, Brian. Oh, absolutely. You're very welcome. All right. Hang out, hang out for a second. Okay. I have a special job for you in a moment. Okay. Well, for more information about the programs in tonight's show, check out these websites. At sites.lafayette.edu slash Lyme, you can learn more about the college's initiative for Malagasy education. Next, at franksmithphotos.com, you can see more of Frank's amazing images from South Sudan, Haiti, India, and beyond. Finally, log on to judasreadingroom.org to find out how you can get involved in this local organization doing such great work. Well, before we leave tonight, Brian, can you help me out with something? We have a special drawing for members sure. of our studio <laughs> audience. So while I tell them what they're going to get, would you mind picking a number out of this sure. bag for me? The Sands Casino Resort Bethlehem has donated a $50 gift certificate, good at the shops, restaurants, and event center. And so, Brian, tell us who won and whoever wins, stand up and let us know who you are. Number 14. Number 14. 14. All right. Congratulations. And thank you so much to our neighbors at the Sands for providing these gift certificates to our two members of our studio audience throughout our season this year. Well, that wraps up our show and our Tempo season. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.
The people of Air Products feel privileged to bring this programming to you. By supporting education and the arts, Air Products strives to improve the quality of life here in the Lehigh Valley, where we call home. How would you like to be part of a studio audience for a live taping of Tempo and Depth? Join us at the PBS 39 Public Media and Education Center on the Steel Stacks campus in Bethlehem. For free tickets and information, 610-867-4677, extension 333, or go online to tempo.wlvt.org. I hope to see you soon. In 1948,